starting out with straight facts. I don't lie in my raps. Hunter Biden smoke. The Democrats know that. Biden ain't win Jack. The name is Barack. He a little B like the pack. The earth might be flat. Marty O'Donnell, Nevada, Nevada's third congressional district. Thank you for joining me. How are you today? I'm good. And I, uh, did you wear the T-shirt for this occasion? I or? did, but I have I wore the English version. I have a Japanese version, of course. Oh, excellent! Yeah, this yeah. could be. You know, if I get into Congress, it, it's it's definitely Revenge of the Nerds time. I think so. <laughs> for sure, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Sure. You know, when you announced your candidacy, I said, "Well, I I don't know his political views. I was familiar <laughs> with who you are, and yeah. I looked it up." And I think, like many people, I was pleasantly surprised. And, you know, you see people who are notable. And the first one that comes to mind is the guy from Boy Meets World running for a campaign. And he's running a very left-wing campaign out in California. Yep. Yep. So you don't know what you're going to get. And I think everything you have on your platform is completely reasonable and in line with what most regular Americans are thinking these days. Yeah. You mentioned when you announced your candidacy that you were about ready to retire. So do you want to tell people what made you come out of the woodworks, if you will, and say, I'm not ready to take a, re to take a break yet. I have to do something. Well, yeah, I, we moved to Nevada a little over three years ago and, um, Nevada is a great place, especially when it comes to the, the weather, um, coming from 20 years in Chicago and 20 years in Seattle. Uh, we'd been visiting here for 15 years and, and we, you know, we love the weather here and my daughters are here. My grandsons are here. So we decided to move here. And essentially I was, uh, I have been successful enough that I could retire, but retire retirement over the last three years has not, uh, let's say it hasn't worked out. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I'm, I get too bored. I, my ho hobbies are not, um, interesting enough to keep me occupied. And I think even my family was like, hey, yeah, you're, it's great you're spending time with us, but uh, maybe you should start doing something again. Um, I dipped my toe in the water trying to figure out what was going on with Republican politics in Clark County here uh, a couple of years ago. And I got a pretty good lay of the land. I wanted to help uh, politicians, especially, I mean, I only wanted to help Republicans. And we had some trouble two years ago. Um, the people I was helping, um, for the most part, nobody won. Uh, it was really kind of sad. The Republicans did not do um, as well as they should have. Uh, the one guy who did win was Joe Lombardo, who was sheriff of Las Vegas, and he won for governor. So that was the one bright spot. So I never really thought about getting into politics, politics uh, as a candidate. I started working with somebody, a guy named Rafael um, Arroyo, who's running for state assembly, who knows my daughter. And my daughter has a 501c3 called Foster Kinship. And she told me I should meet this guy. He was, he was like-minded. He was a conservative and he was a business owner. And maybe I could help him out. Anyway, after talking to him a little bit, I realized uh, he, he had me connect with the people who he was working with. And I started talking to them and just basically offering my services. Like, is there anything I can do to help Republicans? Um, I certainly, you know, I'm willing to contribute money. I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and do some work. Um, I have some, you know, fans and some Twitter followers, a social media presence. Maybe I could bring that to bear. Uh, and then the guy named Jeremy asked me if I would be willing, if I ever thought about running for Congress. And that, really kind of blew my mind. I had never thought about it other than I used to tell my daughters that all of these bozos in Congress think they have a career and they should be there for the rest of their lives. And all they want is money and power. And I, I'm disgusted. It should be more like jury duty. Everybody should get a little notice in the mail that it's time for you to go to Congress. And then when you're, when you've served your time and you've done your duty, you go back home um, so I used to say that it should be Congress duty and it felt like at this eight, this stage of my life, suddenly, uh, I was being asked to put my money where my mouth is and see if I would agree to do Congress duty. Um, so that's what I did. <laughs> now I noticed on your platform when I first started looking into it, 
the the traditional values are big to you and there's a a quote in there excuse me if i misremember it but it doesn't take a a village to to raise a child it takes a family and then a family cr is what creates a village right. what are some of the values that you are pushing for that you see slipping away from american culture you know generationally or no matter the race or background what do you think people need to get back to what do you think we're getting away from too far that you know for me um the values issue is huge because it underpins everything um integrity faith fidelity valor um, the, the, these are traditional values that are global. They're worldwide. It's not, these are not just American values. They're not, they shouldn't just be called family values. These are human values. These are values that people, if they, if they, you lose these values, you start to see society erode. And I think we're seeing that, um, values are being made fun of constantly in the media. Um, it's somehow, you know, old fashioned or, you know, people who have values are hypocrites. Um, this sort of, um, the jokes that, that just constantly come out and the disparaging of people who, who are trying to have values, who have a, a sense of morality and deep faith, um, they're being made fun of all the time. And that's breaking down the most, uh, fundamental, uh, building block of society, which is our families. And I've just always hated this con this quote unquote saying that it takes a you know a village to raise a child. That I just don't believe that. I think it you know to raise a child you have to have a family. Now a family is not just the mother, father, and a child. It is the mother, father, child, aunts, uncles, grandparents, friends. Um, yes, that's what the village is made up. There's no village in any country that isn't made up of families. Everybody knows this. It's so assumed uh, that, you know, the village, the community is made up of strong, should be made up of strong families. And when you disparage the family, um, you are essentially uh, writing a ticket for future societal decay. And that's what I think we're in the middle of now. Absent fathers, um, you know, so many, so many children being brought up without fathers potentially without parents at all. Um, it's just a tragedy. And the federal government should be doing everything it can to incentivize uh, strong families and get out of the way of people who are, you know, the families who, who want to be able to make the best choice for their kids. So if, when it comes to whatever, school choice, um, you know, medical care, uh, you name it, the, the family should be the the number one um, decision maker in every child's life. Would you advocate for something like Florida has done where, you know, they they have made it so that teachers cannot talk about sexuality and personal relationships to a certain age? Is that something you'd be in favor of? Would you be in favor of restricting it to a certain uh age demographic or eliminating it completely or anything like that? Well, certainly, and I get in trouble for saying this at times uh, because I am, I'm a federalist, which means I believe that the enumer enumerated powers that uh, the federal government should be involved in are very constrained. Uh, the, the kind of power you're talking about to determine what teachers are doing or what teachers are teaching in the classroom uh, that should be left up to the local community in the states. So I, yes, I'm in favor of of the local community and and families deciding what is appropriate to be taught to their children. And frankly, I think the federal government should stay out of it a hundred percent. You know, I would be for <laughs> getting rid of the Department of Education at the federal level because I, I think that's a, a, a complete overreach of what the founders intended for centralized power to to have to be able to dictate terms of the the federal government sh can encourage certain behavior or incentivize in certain ways um uh, uh, certain kinds of decisions or or you know champion the values that i'm talking about but it shouldn't be trying to impose uh, these things on the people, especially from Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. needs to have less power. So on one hand, yes, I agree 
uh, you know, the states and local community governments should be able to determine these things. And on the other hand, I don't think the federal government should be involved. Now, is the ballooning of the federal government and government employees something that concerns you? Um, <laughs> And anything like term limits. What's your take on how effectively the federal government's being used or in, incorrectly it's being applied in, in different places? You mentioned abolishing the Department of Education. Is there any other fat that you think needs to be trimmed? And do you think it's as a whole, the government's been too intrusive on, you know, states' rights or just issues in general? Uh, yeah, across the board. Um, the this the system is is rigged it is um tilted towards it, it can't help but grow it can't help but start to bloat and when i say start to bloat i mean it started to bloat you know a century ago uh it is it is completely a bloated system right now the federal government is way too big it's way too intrusive uh it's it's regulating far too many things. It's taxing way too high. Uh, all of this stuff needs to go in the completely other direction. It's not what the founders intended. Um, when I, I, I've looked at how budgets even are um, kept in the military the, and every federal agency, you know, at the end of every quarter, if you haven't spent the money that you were budgeted, you lose that for the next quarter. Uh, or into the future. And which means you're incentivized to never save money. You are incentivized to continue to spend every dime that's allocated to your whatever it is. And then that's the way you're going to even get more. You're going to be able to increase on that, which means why are we surprised at all that the federal government is bloated? It's, it's designed to automatically inflate constantly. Um, I would love to find out. I mean, I got to believe that somebody like Newt Gingrich uh, saw this, saw this fundamental flaw and has has ideas about how to incentivize uh, people in the government um, to actually save money. There should be some some incentive to say, hey, I I saved the department twenty thousand dollars this quarter. It's like, OK, that should that should be a positive thing. We should see incentivize incentivizing anybody who, and any department that can save money for the taxpayers but we're not built that way at all it's not set up that way and it's uh it, it's really if you look at it it's, it's insane it's totally insane uh that's why the government is bloated so i can't imagine how any normal rational person wouldn't be able to say we should be able to cut the fat out of the entire go federal government you know 10 15 percent without damaging anything 100% agree. I think what's <laughs> <laughs> I think what's been happening lately is, you know, this is a way for the government to get more people on their side by saying, "We welcome you into these new departments. We welcome you into these new places." And you're going to get that pension and you're going to advocate for for higher income taxes. You're going to advocate for higher um em employment rates with the government. And, and you're going to rope people in and they're, they're going to be afraid to say anything. They're going to lose their job if they say anything against against the state. And I think that's a real problem, especially where I'm from here in Canada. I, uh, the the amount of federal and and government employees is astronomical. And what you end up getting is either people who are forced to work in unions to, if they want to work in regular jobs or they're forced to work for the government if they hope to have any sort of steady paycheck or any sort of you know, comparable pension or measurable pension that they can actually survive off of after they retire. Another thing I wanted to mention, of course, it is regarding the federal government is your stance on border security. I think the, the border has been swept under the rug the last two months. Um, I reported on it a lot in, in the months leading up to the Trump trial and everything that's been happening uh, with Israel and Palestine. And the numbers are still there, of course, millions in a year and it just basically gets ignored what do you see as the actual solution to this do you th see it as simple as enforcing the laws that are on the books completing the wall reform altogether what's your opinion on that because I, I i know on your platform that it says we need to increase border security yeah well 
it's it's funny when when people say, well, is it as simple as that? And I, yeah, I think it is as simple as that. Um, please, like if, if that's if that's as far as you want to go, that's a huge uh, difference from where we are today. Enforcing the laws that are already on the books. This is you know, if there's anything the federal government is uh, empowered to do. Uh, it's for certainly it's to protect the American citizens and and secure the borders of our country. So please just enforce the laws that are there. Uh, bring back. I would also then bring back some of the things. That, of course, on day one, Biden got rid of all the uh, uh, mechanisms that uh, Donald Trump put in place to protect our borders, which was working very well. Remain in Mexico and and many other things. All of those things should come back. Um, uh, building the wall, which whatever that exactly means, whether it's a, a, always a physical barrier or, uh, you know, uh, drones or high tech ways of policing. Certainly the idea of uh, clarifying the law about um, uh, people who are who are, who are claiming refugee status. I mean, that that has to be. Uh, uh, change completely because it's it's been bastardized by the the liberals and the and the and the non-government organizations that are going out there and 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 teaching people who are coming from all over the world how to claim claim refugee status and and that needs to 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 stop and so that's number one if we can just like stop the bleeding you have to stop the bleeding on, on the especially the southern border now uh, and then we can talk about real solutions in terms of you know coming up with a, an actual immigration system that is modernized and and makes sense uh but I, I having debates about how to to do the second part before you've done the first part makes absolutely no sense to me at all all right as you can probably judge by the shirt there's something very specific i want to ask you about <laughs> As in video games, as it sure. pertains to DEI programs and DEI being injected into games. Now, you are are very well known for the Halo theme. My friend Neil is going to be very jealous. Shout out to Neil. Um, <laughs> what's been happening lately and what fans are rejecting is the forced diversity narratives in games. Now, I just got finished writing something today about how... Uh, Warner Brothers Games has started a program, a leadership program for women and non-binary people. This comes right after they lost $200 million on a Suicide Squad video game that they hired a DEI consultancy firm to write characters for. Poison Ivy is an orange-haired uh, girl, for example. We'll leave it at that. But they create these characters for people and they create narratives for people. I've spoken to some people in the industry about this before. When you were involved in games, was this on anybody's mind? Was the amount of diversity, the amount of uh, transgender characters in games, was this ever a certain any a to ever a topic that anybody thought they should worry about? Uh, you know, no, it wasn't. And and the current, um, you know go go woke go broke um we just keep seeing that happen over and over again when dei is is not dei it is not diversity equity and inclusion it is code word for essentially a marxist uh worldview of of power structures and you know there's all many there's so many uh catch words that are being injected into the conversation colonization decolonization all of these kinds of things um it, it it is so far from what especially in the entertainment business what people should be worried about are you going to tell a good story are you going to make a good game are you going to do something that's compelling emotionally for people uh that's fun for people that's what that's what uh, creators should be concerned about now you know i <laughs> We've had our share of, I guess I would have to say diverse characters, but it's like it wasn't because we needed to make sure there was a certain percentage of, you know, fill in the blank. It was because these were like either great actors or this was going to be a great character. Um, so this was it was never the 
any part of what our discussions were about. Like, let's make sure we we fill in the blanks for all of the, you know, so, so the game characters reflect perfectly um, the makeup of the society. Um, that is just such a creatively dampening way of approaching things, which is why I think the fans are rejecting. The fans don't necessarily reject uh, movies or games uh, because diversity or equity inclusion kinds of things are forced into their face. Certainly they don't like, you know, being preached to, but basically these are not good products. Uh, that's at the end of the day, it's not fun to play. It is not interesting. These characters don't sound real. Um, that's what ends up happening. People just don't like it. Uh, they're not good stories. They're not memorable. So um, yeah, we, I, to, to, to be honest with you, I saw this starting to come in the last few years of my time in the video game industry. And I'm, uh, I'm glad that I sort of retired from video games when I did, cause I could see, um, there might've been a few, um, arguments, let's say <laughs> that I would be involved in coming down there. One of the questions people have around this, I think, and that I have is why do they keep doing it? It's been a couple of years now where these big projects have failed and despite and Disney's so guilty of this, they, they just keep hammering down and doubling down and tripling down. Yeah. Why do they keep pushing forward? Now, I, I've heard that the the ESG money and the DEI money is running dry from from investors. I, I've read about this. I've written about this. I've been told this. What is the what is the reason why these companies keep pushing forward with things like this? Are they afraid of backlash or are, are they afraid of money drying up? Do they just want to push forward ideologically? What's your take on that? Why do you think that, you know, against all odds seemingly that, that some of these major studios and movies and gaming still push forward uh, with DEI and all these different forms of it? Well, you know, I, I can't say for certain what's in everybody's minds, but I, I know that when I was there, when I was talking to, you know, when I was on the board of directors, let's say at Bungie, when I, you know, talked to the higher ups at Microsoft, um, there is a lot of fear and the fear started creeping in. There is fear that you are going to um, essentially get on the wrong side of some special interest groups uh, who can be very loud and very annoying. So let's placate those people. So I, I would say fear is probably one of the biggest things. I don't think um, in my experience that these are deeply held beliefs. Um, you have to understand that, especially in the big companies, uh, the the C-suite and the, the executives, they are just constantly, all they're doing is looking at the bottom line. And if they think something could affect the bottom line, I honestly think a lot of these people are empty suits. They don't actually have core values. So they adopt the core values of the moment to make sure they're on the right side so they don't get uh, any sort of backlash. Uh, and that's an indictment against the kinds of people who end up running companies. I understand that, but I've, I've rarely found people with strong uh, moral character running the companies. They tend to just be, they go the way the wind blows and um, it's going to take them a little while to realize this is actually not helping their bottom line. And so um there, there might be a few true believers out there, but it's few and far between, in my opinion. Uh, and, and it doesn't make sense. Almost nobody who ends up being at the top level of, of, of these uh, entertainment companies actually ever made enter any entertainment. They aren't actual directors. They're not artists. They're not musicians. Uh, they're not writers. They haven't created anything. They might have come from marketing or have an MBA work their way up through you know up the production side of things where they're not really making things they're just overseeing the production side um and so for some reason i i just i don't trust their judgment they just don't have good judgment when it comes to this and they have a lot of fear so i would say fear is the big driving factor here now forgive me for not knowing but is there a thing you can think of like 20 years ago where where people were jumping on these executives were jumping on it as the thing. Like we got to keep in stride with this. We got to keep up with this dominant narrative. Is there anything that comes to mind? 
Huh. Well, uh, you know, it, I started seeing it a little bit even during our Halo 2, uh, which goes back quite a ways. We were making Halo 2, you know, in 2002, 2003, uh, which was uh, close enough after 9-11 and if you, you know, you know the story of Halo, it's it's about this, you know, group of religious zealots that, <laughs> that uh, essentially uh, uh, believe t and, and, you know, are, will commit suicide in order to, for, you, know, co you know, keep their religion going. I mean, that's the characters we had for the Covenant. And we uh, that started making Microsoft a little bit nervous because they felt like there was a um, could be some backlash uh, from from the you know the the Muslim community in the Middle East that, that maybe this could be seen as you know uh, Islamophobic and so we had to be all of a sudden we were being asked to be very careful about some names of people or references or phrases and things like that. So I started seeing that and I thought, well, that's not necessarily unreasonable because we weren't trying to do some sort of allegory uh, about the political situation, let's say in the, in, you know, in the world that had to do with jihadists and all the rest of it. Um, but I, I could see there was a point you probably, you, maybe you know the story, but one of our main characters, the arbiter, was not the arbiter during the whole time we were making halo 2 the character's name was uh he was called the the dervish huh. and uh we had recorded all the voice i had directed all the actors and everybody was using the term dervish and then we found out that like oh uh this could uh be an in seen as an insult um because there is a a, a islamic religious uh figure known as dervishes and um so we had to change it we were we were forced to change that um name uh to to a different name so we came up with the arbiter i was never really happy about it i thought you know this is an artistic choice this is what we had from the beginning we were not making any sort of trying to make any sort of political or religious comment um you know, we had tons of religious imagery, the the Ark, Halo, the Covenant. All these things are, are sort of religious, you know, imbued with religious, you know, terminology. So I didn't see why the dervish was a problem, but uh, we were forced to change that. So I could see that there were going to be the bigger the product, the more uh, fingers would be in the pie trying to mess with things. Yeah. And I, and I think back to games of that era. There were definitely games with with much more specific and obvious political references. I think of Metal Gear Solid Four. I don't know if you're familiar with that. That was basically about wars in the Middle East being fought right. by uh, private military corporations. Yep. But uh, that's interesting. Oh well. To... By the way, you can always like if your plot line deals with an evil white person or an evil corporation, you're fine. <laughs> that is like. Evil white guys, especially men, and evil corporations, no problem. You will never get pushback on that. Um, that's just, and that's been around forever. Like it's always great, and it's, and you can also be, yeah. Let's make the Christians hypocrites and mm. and bad people. That's easy. You, you're never going to get pushback on that. There you go. I think that one of the games the follow probably. If that came out now, the some of the original stories, mm -hmm. even though they're even though it's very popular now, some of the original stories they would not be allowing some of that. I mean, on one hand, you have people who are who are think they're they're worshippers of Elvis, but on the other hand, you've got you know uh, how can, how can I say it like like children who are sacrificing themselves to nuclear weaponry and stuff like right. that. Right. So it's a really interesting uh, time that we live in, you might say. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you hear Jerry Seinfeld uh, complaining now about, you know, the kind of comedy that's no longer allowed. And even, you know, there will never be, at least under the current atmosphere that we have, the climate that's happening in entertainment, you won't, you won't get some of these great sitcoms that, that used to be on TV. And I think it's the same way across the board with all sorts of entertainment. It's going to be a while for this 
tide to like pass through and maybe withdraw and we get back to, hey, let's let entertainment people and creative people just make what they want to make. And if you don't like it, then don't buy it. But, um, you know, the. I don't know who, you know, the thought police that are, that's happening in today's world is, is completely insane right now, in my opinion. Do you think that it, it's too late though? I look at a lot of these things. I don't think there's going to be many other sitcoms that, that come out specifically sitcoms, but do you think it's too late for a lot of the movie studios or is the, the backing of the money too much and they can just, they sort of wait it out? Well, you know, I what I'm seeing is there is that trend. Number one, we, media is so expansive now with with uh, you know all the different social media outlets. So you can have um, the competition go out there into the world, and people can have their sort of niche areas in different social media outlets. And if they're successful, if people, if the audience finds that, they'll they'll come to it. And you're getting the same thing with you know uh, crowdfunded uh, uh, entertainment. Um, you're starting to see, you know, like, um, for example, The Chosen, I think, is a, is a really well done, great series. It's getting having great success. It would never be produced by any normal uh, established studio in Hollywood or any place else. It has to be done as a crowdfunded thing. And then the audience comes and sees it. And so I think there is a tendency where where these things can become successful again. As long as nobody puts their thumb on the scale and tries to make these things go away, um, let let the you know let the different ideas compete with each other and let different creative people create what they want to create and 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 not be interfered with. So, I yeah, I don't know sure. I don't think it's, it might be too late for the big studios, but that's fine. The big studios can go away and dissolve into nothingness over time. That's fine with me. Yeah, if there was maybe like a Steam platform for for movies or something, that would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Martyforcongress.vote is where the platform is, uh, Nevada's 3rd Congressional District. Anything else you want to say? Any uh, You, you want to tell anybody which video games they should be playing? <laughs> <laughs> Support, throw, a back, throw a big backing or behind a, an indie game or something? Boost there. Oh, wow, there yeah. Some. You know, well, I'll tell you, the... the the game that it was the last game that I worked on, which is still being worked on now and, and is getting better and better and is about to come out with a, its campaign mode uh, is six days in Fallujah. Oh, which is, I, that's it, on my wish list, Marty. Yes. Yeah. It's a tremendously good game. Um, not a very big team working on it. The team is getting bigger all the time, but they're doing just great stuff. I talked to, you know, my former partner, Jamie the other day, and he's very encouraging. Uh, uh, I, it, you, what's happening with the development of that game is just getting better and better all the time. It's a slow build. It's, it's not the, uh, you know, it doesn't have the backing of, you know, a Microsoft or an Activision. So it can just, you know, hire a thousand people and, and spend a couple of years and then come out full fledged, but it's in early access and it's getting better all the time. So I highly recommend people ch check that one out. You heard it here first. Thanks a lot, Marty. <laughs> I appreciate it. Always happy to talk about politics and games. This is yeah. a mixture of my perfect world. <laughs> so I appreciate it a lot, man. Great. Thanks, Andrew.